So I'm discussing the two papers, but I will discuss mostly the intersection between the two papers, uh, which means the refugee issue. Uh, the reason, so there were two papers, one by Al Roth on, on, on mobility, uh, looking crossing borders in search of welfare, safety, or health, and uh, market design for refugees by Wayne Jones. So the intersection between the two is the matching of refugee issues. Uh, I think it's an important issue. I'm quoting uh, from, uh, I think the first uh, blog post you, you wrote, Al, was in July of 2015 on this. Uh, I think the title was Refugee as a Natural Application of Matching. Um, I will then quote Will from Will's presentation. One of the, he didn't present it actually, but it's in the paper. Uh, one of the most urgent global humanitarian challenges today and one where market designers can contribute tremendously, tremendously is the refugee issue. So I will pretty much uh, motivate what I'm doing on, based on this. And the third justification is that I comply with the guidelines to uh, the discussion from, uh, that we received from Alex and Scott to heavily build on your own work uh, in your discussion. That's what I will do. So what I will talk about, uh, <coughs> following up on what uh, the, the quote I, 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 I cited from Will's uh, paper, is that I, I think the social value of market designer time is very high in the context of refugees. And yet there is very, it's also recognized as, as a first order social and political issue. And yet in the last two years, we've seen surprisingly little work uh, in, in the field, I would say, and uh, one reason may be uh, incentives for market designers to, to go into the field. And I was a, at a, I'm not a market designer, I'm not a matching person, I'm, I'm a migration person and a development uh, economist. Uh, and when you uh, try to, 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 to bring people to, to this field and tell them uh, how important it would be for them to contribute and think that you, you encounter two types of resistance. One is, you know, it's a new field, it's unclear what the payoff will be. Uh, and second, uh, you have a, a, a kind of, uh, you have to elicit a theoretical interest, okay? Why is it theoretically different from school choice, okay? You have two sides of the match, so what, what, what is in there which is essentially different, okay? And what I will try to do in this presentation is mostly to, 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 to draw maybe a few di directions where there may be such uh, fruitful uh, extensions. So uh, one way which is, doesn't work is to say to people, it's very important that you work on this important social issue. You appeal to their social and political conscience. So, uh, it's maybe a necessary but certainly not a sufficient condition. The other one is, as I said, to, to show why uh, this could be different. So let me outline three issues, uh, three directions for which I think there is either some essential or some sufficiently <coughs> different uh, things from, from school choice, for example. So as I'll set devils in the, in the details, so once you start thinking uh, deeply about a, a different context, you realize that it's it's different. But but I think there are three things at least uh, that that can be pointed out. <coughs> One is that uh, essentially countries don't want to be chosen. Okay, we're talking about matching people to places, but these places are not welcoming the people. Okay, they do it either by constraint uh, or uh, they have to, to, to have incentives, okay, to, to accept these people. Uh, so if you, uh, I will give more detail, but I think here there is an, an, an essential difference between the local context where the state government has the capacity to enforce the quota system, okay, and international context where it does not, and you have to think about other things. The second, and, and this first problem has to do, uh, I believe, with the public good nature of refugee protection. Okay, so that's one dimension which I think make it different <coughs> from uh, school choice. The second one, and Will uh, pointed it uh, in his presentation, is secondary movement, free migration. Okay, there is, differently from school choice, a very, uh, th this dimension is important empirically and politically. It's something which uh, is very important for governments, for local authorities, to minimize free movement, free migration, and the design here should take this uh, into account quite heavily. And the third dimension 
is this that matching uh, in the context of refugees by nature a screening exercise. So Al insisted on the security screening in it. But in the refugee literature, there is a very old problem, which is screening between true refugees and economic migrants <coughs> abusing the asylum system. I think matching is doing part of the job, but not all of the job. And I think there are many things to explore as to how matching uh, models and mechanism design can uh, in improve and, and, and uh, learn from uh, the refugee context. So let me first talk about the first issue, the incentives not to be chosen. So uh, one of the discussions I had with uh, Will and Alex when we, we started exchanging about this uh, uh, is, is that I believe that if you do matching alone, okay, say we will match refugees to two countries, um, using uh, this or that uh, model, which is not important here for the discussion, I think one of the problems here is that you run the risk of countries uh, being happy not to be chosen. So this can be manifested in three ways. One way is just to refuse the quota system. To do the matching, you need some initial quotas, okay, how many places are available in different places, okay, and uh, countries uh, can just want to opt out of the system. This is what Britain said when the EU proposed the quota system, or because they, they could do so legally, they had this opting out option that they negotiated for immigration issues when they entered the EU in 73. Uh, some countries that could not opt out will say they will hold the referendum, like Hungary and the whole visa work group uh, with other Eastern European countries, and, and just to, to refuse the quota system totally. So that's one strategy. The other strategy is just to be cynical about not being attractive, being happy not to be chosen. So that would be uh, this quote from the Czech Prime Minister, Mr. Sobotka, when the EU proposed in May, June 2015 this uh, mandatory quota system. He said, well, refugees from North Africa and the Middle East just don't want to come to the Czech Republic because it's, it's too cold. Okay, so, and of course that was uh, kind of cynical, but you can think that this also points to incentives uh, that you can become, uh, you can deter, actually, and it is the third strategy, refugees from applying, from listing you as a potential destination by treating them badly in different ways, very long application processes, uh, putting them in, in bad material conditions, or systematically deporting them uh, when they come as asylum seekers uh, to, to places such as Nauru, as Australia is doing. So you have to think about this context and, and, and try to do something about it. So there are different solutions. One it, which is realized at the local level is uh, forced <coughs> participation of municipalities, of canton, of lender, uh, and overcompensation. You give very generous, generous financial compensation. And, and this is easy to do relatively at the, at the uh, subnational level. And indeed, Germany, Switzerland, England have programs that do this relatively well. But at the international level, this is very differ difficult to do. In progress is what the EU is, is doing. So what they have is the quota system with a distribution key that they try to do in a fair way. Uh, so each country gets a quota which is based on its GDP, its population, and these type of things. But what happens if countries uh, drag their feet or don't want to participate, etc.? Well, they are discussing, and it's unclear uh, what type of sanction or financial uh, incentive should the EU uh, give. Okay, so in uh, September 2015, they talked about a sanction for countries that would not participate. That would be 2,000 of, of, of a percent of a country's GDP of the country's GDP. So where well, that, that number comes from, no one knows. But when you do the math, it means that you would pay a sanction of 1,500 euros per refugee, which is ridiculously long. Then in May, they said, well, there will be a sanction for countries refusing refugees uh, of 250,000 uh, euros per uh, refugee, which is jumping more than 100 times. Uh, the initial number. So they are looking for the right financial incentive. Okay? 
Uh, the third uh, way to address it, but it's an example, is what we proposed with, and indeed you got it right, with it's Jesus Fernandez Huertas Moraga, is only one person uh, from Spain, from Madrid, um, uh, with me. So we had the first paper in the Journal of Public Economics uh, two years ago, what, which was on called tradable immigration quotas for any so it, refugees was the main application, but it, essentially it was something designed to address uh, issues with immigration when there is a public good dimension. Okay, so refugees is, is uh, clearly uh, one such thing. And then we had this follow-up paper uh, in CSE for Economic Studies last year, really uh, about the European context and the refugee crisis. So we, what we proposed there is to say, let's take the first, uh, as a first stage, what the EU is actually doing, which is the quota system. Okay, but let's add two other layers, the matching, for all the reasons I don't have to explain uh, in, in this room why it would be good to do matching. Okay, and then to solve this public good dimension and this incentive problem, have the tradable quota system. Okay, so the quotas could be traded, so this has two advantages. One is that you lower the expected cost for countries of participating into the scheme. If it's really impossible for you to admit refugees, then you can buy your way out. There is a discussion whether the, there is a repugnant market or not. I will uh, come back to this uh, later. Uh, but there is also another advantage, which is to solve the problem with matching. And what we argued is that there is nothing new in what we proposed in terms of the tradable quota system or in terms of matching, but the novelty came from combining the two uh, because the risk with the tradable uh, refugee quotas uh, is the, what we could call refugee dumping, that rich countries would dump, so to speak, their refugees on poor countries that would be willing, be willing to accept them for money. But with the matching, you have the constraint that refugees can only go to countries that they choose to go to. Okay, so that limits and that gives incentives to countries to, to, to be chosen. Uh, and that's the second point, because if you are not chosen in, in what we propose, then you have to pay for the unfilled part of the quota. You have to pay the market price uh, determined on the tradable refugee admission quotas market. Okay, and so it's always an optimal strategy for you as a country to be oversubscribed. And you, if, if anything, you are not chosen, then you will have incentive to engage in marketing uh, and Finland would have been uh, incentivized in this system to, to try hard to keep its, its refugees rather than, than paying the, the price of the market for the infant part of its quota. Okay? So that's uh, what we propose. So that's the, 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 that may be only one way to address it and there, there are maybe other ways to address it. So I'm, I'm asking here at the end of the slide, uh, is this a repeat market? Is it political fee? politically feasible, of course, when you tell countries uh, about this system, it's, it's a hard sell politically, but the true way to, to think about it is that you give countries ways to contribute to the public good, either financially or physically. So physical solidarity is to host refugees on your soil, financial solidarity is that you fund this uh, protection provided by others, but you are the funder, and it's kind of, I think, reminiscent to what I'll propose for is global kidney exchange, somehow, okay? Uh, there are, of course, alternatives to be explored. Uh, the pledges, uh, countries pledging quotas, uh, incentive auctions, other things, I leave to you to try to think about it, okay? Second issue, and I will be uh, shorter on the, the, the two others, the second important issue, which I think makes it uh, maybe not here essentially, but at least sufficiently different from school choice, is this notion of secondary movement, free migration. Okay, so uh, in any refugee situation, in any matching for refugee situation, refugees would trade off being legal with refugee status in the place where they get protection with moving to a place which is a preferred destination but with an illegal status but with some prospect of amnesty at some point, legalization, etc. So you have this secondary movement or remigration um, problem which is uh, important 
And here, matching may mitigate the problem because you get, on, a, on average, a better match, a better destination than a random allocation, but it's only partial uh, mitigation, okay? Uh, how much remigration matching would uh, prevent uh, is an empirical question, which, of course, uh, we would be interested uh, in, uh, in evaluating. Okay, so matching reduces this, but does not eliminate it. Okay, so the, the importance of the secondary movement is on um, two uh, dimensions. I would say one is on the refugee side, which opens the door for manipulation somehow, okay? Because when you're asked to list, uh, uh, to rank the potential destination that you would accept as countries of asylum, well, here you can anticipate that Maybe your first choice is Germany, your second is, is uh, Spain, and your third is uh, Austria. But you may rank Austria before <coughs> Spain because Austria gives you an easier access to Germany, for example. So th there is a whole issue here of how this secondary movement remigration expectation will uh, make the, 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 the revelation of preference uh, truthful or not. Uh, and on the country's uh, side, on the side of the receiving countries, uh, minimizing remigration is a very important issue for many, many reasons, security being one, so cross-country, this is uh, very obvious, um, and how this uh, minimizing of remigration, secondary movement, how is it weighted compared to the other priorities that countries have in the match, I think is something interesting to, to explore, and obviously different matching models Will have uh, will perform differently in terms of reducing uh, secondary movement, and you can when you say I prefer this type of uh, mechanism compared to the other. Well, maybe this would be reversed once you consider uh, remigration. Okay, so I have kind of ongoing work on this with uh, Olivier Tercier, but there is very this is very pre preliminary, and there is a lot to do. The last issue I want to mention is uh, is screening. Uh, so I will uh, fully uh, accept and, and, and think it's very important that the, the security thing uh, that we have to think about. What I, I, uh, as was uh, emphasized by, by Al, um, but I think the, another interesting dimension which has been there all the time in the refugee literature is the screening between true refugees, those who really need the protection, who are vulnerable, etc., and the economic migrants sneaking in, abusing the asylum system to get uh, to, to, to for, for, for economic reasons. Uh, I think, of course, the reality is more complex. Uh, humans of both type and weigh differently uh, safety and uh, issues and, 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 and economic prospects uh, for future, future integration. Okay, so this uh, screening uh, problem uh, has been there for some time. Some economists like Bob and Kramer have been thinking about different models to, to get separating equilibria. Well, well, you would be able to, to see which one is which, of which type, etc. But here, I think, again, matching mitigates the problem, but does not fully eliminate it. So obviously, you would think that those who would rank the 28 European countries in a European matching uh, uh, scheme as potential destination where they are ready to go. I would believe anyone ready to go to Letonia, Latvia, uh, is probably desperately in need of, of asylum, so probably a true refugee, while, while someone in, in, in saying, I want Germany, that's it. Uh, it's probably more of an economic migrant type. Of course, the problem is that you cannot use this information to do the screening because then it would lead to manipulation. Okay. Uh, but still, uh, empirically exposed, you could use this information to, to see whether this or that mechanism, particular <coughs> mechanism, would favor more uh, those who uh, have a short list, those who have a long list, etc. And so here too on the screening uh, dimension, I think there are interesting things to explore. So to conclude, I think refugees are very natural and important application of matching. Uh, very little has been done. There are potential 
directions, I, I would argue, for theoretical innovation, how to incentivize countries to be chosen, tradable uh, refugee admission quotas or something else. Uh, how do different models perform in terms of secondary movement, in terms of screening, and main point, suggestion anyone. I think, as I said at the beginning, the main motivation <coughs> here is to say there is a uh, socially uh, very high value of market designers times in this field. There is a very high political demand. Uh, and so I think it's important to, to brainstorm and, and find directions to for research here. Awesome. Thank you so much. So I want to just raise three issues. First of all, um, in Al's talk on repugnance, there's, it, it, he raised two ways in which states treat <coughs> transactions as repugnant. One of which is they're actually illegal to have a cash transaction. The second of which is you cannot write an enforceable contract. This is a totally different thing. There's a sea of difference between these two, these two things, right? And when, for example, I mean, this is, this is highlighted in the housing deal, this is exactly what the Supreme Court did with racial covenants in 1948. They were not made illegal to have racially restricted covenants. They were made unenforceable. Now, the reason why they're different is, in fact, we know how to deal with situations in which the state won't enforce a contract. We can post bonds, we can do lots of other things in which money can still come in, right? Even though the state isn't there willing to tell someone to, to do stuff. Whereas if it's illegal, then we're in a world of you know, purely non-pecuniary transaction. That, and that actually is important to think about. Secondly, I love the discussion of the ref refugees, you know, refugees trading mechanism. Obviously, the secondary movement is huge. Do we have data on this? I mean, it seems like it's incredibly important from an empirical exercise, both for two things. One, which is it is the best evidence we have on the preferences of the, of the migrants, right? We have, we have a technology that goes back to, say, Matt Kahn's thesis here in Chicago 30 years ago, on 25 years ago, on using migration as, as showing us that, in fact, migrants aren't crazy about Finland in February. Um, and also, obviously, it probably should be affect how we design the quotas to begin with. Right? And in fact, if Germany knows they're going to get 50% of the migrants anyway, then maybe you don't want to give them so many initially or, or you know, uh, something like that. And then the third point is you know, making matching of migrants, making matching of refugees more efficient is worthwhile doing for many, many reasons. The one thing that I'm not very optimistic about is that it will actually turn down hatred. Right? There's an old line for those of us who work in the, in the hatred field that you know, repetition is far more important than truth when creating hatred. Uh, Joseph Goebbels, who knew a thing about this, actually said that. Um, and you know, I, I don't think, in fact, getting the matches more efficient is likely to make any, any difference to Donald Trump whatsoever or anyone else who's engaged in, in this. That doesn't mean it isn't a reason to do it, but it, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't sell it as, as likely to happen. Sure. I, I worry that if you go down the road of eliciting preferences from the refugees, that you'll actually end up with a lemons result that will destroy the participation on the other side. Because if ill intent or terrorist intent is completely private information, and I'm the US State Department, and I believe that the people that want to blow up the Sears Tower will all list the US first, and I believe I have no ability to detect who they are, then once you introduce a mechanism where they get to elicit those preferences, I say I'm not going to play anymore because I look forward and the only equilibrium of this mechanism is one that I don't want. And so I just refuse to participate. And so I worry that this is a context where allowing the refugees to rank will lead to a situation where no one Will, will get a place because of the private information concerns. Other questions? Should we give the panel's uh, others? Well, I'm still concerned about the issue about the, um, the market for organs. I mean, you, I don't think there was a whole discussion about the disadvantage of having a free market where individuals are free to engage in private contracts. I think there is a moral issue, but uh, there is a lot of positive uh, aspects of that, right? Even Gary Baker highlighted the benefit of having a free market. So I wonder, what do you think would be the most problematic issue of having a free market besides the moral issue? All right, so I think let's pass it back to the panel for, uh, for commentary. Okay, let me just try to answer the most recent question. Uh, I don't know what accounts for uh, the, the widespread resistance to markets for, for Some of it has to do with 
with market design questions. That is, people are concerned that market organs will be exploit vulnerable, that, that people will sell organs because they're desperately poor and the only rich people can buy them. Uh, of course, if you're a market designer, you could talk about designing markets and say only the federal government could purchase organs and they would be allocated in some uh, market. But, but, but if you say even Gary Becker thought that a free market might be a good idea, I'm not, I'm not sure I understand the word even. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I used to talk to Gary quite a bit about this. Um, and one of the things I would say to him is that when you see something that's against the law, everywhere in the world, there's some chance, there's some aspect of, about that that we're not understanding well if we think that simply explaining the, the, the voluntary transactions between well-informed participants and food welfare, uh, you know, that, that might not be the answer to the problem. So, so I'm not sure, so I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about repentant transactions because I'd like to understand what it is that, that makes some transactions repugnant and illegal almost everywhere. You know, surrogacy, which I talked about, it's, it's legal in California, it's not legal in Germany. Selling kidneys is illegal everywhere except Iran. Um, of course, it's hard to suppress. There are thriving black markets, like this is one in Baku and other um, But there's something going on there, and markets require social support. Markets are social institutions. We build lots of markets, but there are some markets we refrain from building. And I absolutely wish I understood that better. Cool. Thanks. Will? Um, thanks. Uh, okay, so there were a couple of things that, were, that I can sort of speak to. I'll, I'll limit myself to a couple of them. Um, so yeah, there's loads of evidence on secondary movement. Um, it happens, so the, the, the headline takeaway is it happens almost all the time unless states engage in forced procedures of a mobilization. Um, and do we have micro data? Do we know like who's going, who's going where? Uh, people move to big cities, people move with their families, so in Britain it's Manchester and London, but so yeah, we've got a lot of quantitative stuff on this. Um, this depends very much on laws though, right? So we have a result from the Canadian Supreme Court that says you cannot limit the mobility of anyone within Canada, sure, you want a bit of Canada. Germany recently went to the European Court to get the opposite legal finding, which is that it's perfectly legal to make a refugee stay at a particular bit of Germany if it helps their integration to be adjudicated by the state, presumably. Um, so yeah, there's loads of stuff on that, and I, I take the point. Um, on hatred, again, I'm sympathetic to this. I think you're right, I'm not gonna like, you know, deal with this in total. I think one thing that might help a little bit is if at the local level, you minimize things blowing up in the council's face. So refugees turn up and we just can't cope, right? Um, and that I think underlines yeah, the willingness very, very quickly. Um, and secondly, if the community feels like it has had a chance to have some sort of control or engagement with the process. I think that might get you some more buy-in, but yeah, I'm, I'm squeezing out little gains here, and the, in general, horrendousness of the world is something I can't do much about. Um, the market balance thing is very, very interesting, I'm gonna have to think more about it. I think, so two thoughts in the first instance. The first is I think this is one of the reasons why matching will work, works better at the sub-national level, where there's gonna be less of that, right? So it's, it's you know, it's your Yorkshire Council or whatever, rather than the American government. Um, but another thing that might help in that instance would be, so one of the things we've been playing around with in the British context is allowing refugees to express preferences indirectly. There's an information problem here, which is to say, you know, what does a refugee know about the difference between Falkirk and Devon? Uh, and so instead of giving them a form and being like, here you go, um, you can allow them to express preferences over properties of neighborhoods. Um, and via that, you can, you can construct their, their, their ranking of areas by asking them about property, you know, do you want this or this, and how much do you care about that and that? Um, and in that case, uh, you, know, you wouldn't be able to say USA, right? Um, or you, wouldn't, or you wouldn't even be able to say New York, right? You can only express preferences of the types of neighborhoods you want. So it's harder to see how our terrorist could use the same kind of strategy. Okay. Oops, yes. just add oh, okay, sure. A line about data on, on refugee movement. I don't know how much data there is on refugee movement, but of course, there's got to be lots of data on migration patterns, and people tend to form in communities. So one of the examples I like, and it's actually a refugee example in the United States, is that there's a big Somali-American community in Lewiston, Maine. And it's, it's not because of the weather. Uh, it's because they already, you know, through some resettlement, some Somalis lived in Maine, and it turns out if you're a Somali, it's comfortable to go to other places where there are Somalis. And of course, that can, if, if as Will said, if, if there's too much concentration, that can impede integration. But if there's too little concentration, then you, 
you have to have excellent English before you can find work. Whereas if there's a community of, of people who are there ahead of you and who can speak their language, then you can start to work while while you're learning English. So, so I think refugees matching is going to be partly about communities and peer effect and not, not just about individual families. Well, also very appropriate topics for here in Chicago. Hello, why don't you close that? So, uh, on, on two of uh, Ed's points, uh, I've seen the removal movements, so that the, the problem, there are two questions, yes, there are a lot of secondary movements, the question is that, well, what I meant is that, uh, what, how much it would reduce this, and to yeah, be yeah. able to... Uh, how much, how much good mass would reduce secondary, absolutely. Is ...to ask people mm -hmm. about their preferences, okay, and this has never been done, okay, so the only... Uh, data we have, uh, for which we have a ranking of potential migrants in need is in the Gallup survey. Uh, so you can look at the Gallup survey of Iraq and Syria, etc., and, and you see you know, people are asked, where would you go? Would you like to immigrate? Where would you like to go? And they, they rank the countries. Okay, but again, this is just showing that there is a diverse set of countries, but you have no idea of what is the, the utility uh, gradient between place one, place two, place three, and so you, and, and these are not the ones who actually migrate, you don't follow them. So for now, there is no empirical way to, to estimate how much it would, would reduce the, the problem, but I think it's, it's really empirically a very interesting thing to do. On hatred, uh, I think you, you're right, but I think if you believe that matching would improve integration, probably it would do something maybe not statically when people at this time of the initial allocation, okay? But uh, maybe there is some, hopefully, some yeah, I agree integration with outcomes. That, that's a comparative static in my model, I agree with that. Sorry? That's a comparative static in my model, Patriot, so I agree with that. Improving <laughs> 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 <Yeah. laughs> integration does decrease hatred, so it's, it's, uh, yeah. Okay, then, oh, well, no. yeah, we, we can talk about it. Uh, then there was a question about uh, your question about, you know, I don't want the ones who want me, uh, that's obviously a hard sell. I think it's a question for, for the people who do, who do the theory, uh, but that's also why here the screen, security screening issue is so much important. I don't think uh, countries would forfeit their uh, sovereignty in security screening, so you can think probably of a two-step. Uh, screening one, what that would be done at the global level for the uh, international matching, and then probably countries would have the last word, obviously, as to who they, they let in. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Let's thank all of our speakers. And